Hello, everyone. My name is Rocky Yap. I'm a gastroenterologist and hepatologist in the Chicagoland area. I am uh, thrilled to be part of this presentation tonight with uh, one of the, the most important GI or hepatology thought leaders in the country. Uh, but first, I'd like to get a little paperwork out of the way. This uh, event is a CME event. I am thrilled to report that the uh, advocate Aurora Health Systems is providing the CME tonight, and it will be a uh, uh, Advocate Aurora Health System is one of the largest health systems in the Midwest, uh, covering numerous hospitals. They're now grown into Wisconsin and other parts of the country, and they do an excellent job and are dedicated to provide CME uh, for physicians in all areas of medicine. So I want to give a special thanks to Javier Madero. He is a uh, at Good Samaritan Hospital to help make this uh, the CME event possible. Um, I'd like to go to the next slide. This slide will be shown um, both now and at the end of the talk when Steve uh, finishes his talk and we finish our Q&A. Uh, it is a way for you to get CME after you see the talk. And uh, we encourage all of you that watch this, this excellent talk to make sure you um, come and, uh, and make sure you uh, apply for that CME credit. So one of the many hats I have, I'm also on the uh, board of directors for the American Liver Foundation, and I'm very proud of the American Liver Foundation. It is a national organization that is dedicated to provide information, education, advocacy for patients in our, in our country with liver disease. It is a national community of patients, caregivers, and medical professionals dedicated to helping people improve their liver health. It provides guidance and life-saving resources and we see the American Liver Foundation as a beacon for the 100 million patients in America that are affected by liver disease. So we are, the American Liver Foundation is proud advocates for both patients and families affected by liver disease. And I am thrilled to be part of this organization. And, and I hope uh, all of you at the end of this uh, lecture will see a way for you also to become more involved with the organization as well. So that before I go on, I go on a, the most important part, I'd like to introduce my good friend who I've known for 30 years plus, uh, Steve Flam. Now, Steve, those of you who don't know Steve, Steve is a literally an international thought leader in liver disease. He has given he has written countless articles and uh, been the principal investigator in numerous studies and has become an international thought leader, teacher, lecturer and is currently the professor of medicine and the part, division of gastroenterology at, uh, at Rush and uh, heads up as, heads up the, well, the transplant program has not only been a outstanding resource for all of us in Chicago, he has been recognized as an international resource for teaching liver disease and helping many of us become better hepatologists. I am very fortunate to have learned from Steve and I can honestly say I am a better doctor, a better hepatologist and physician because of my friendship with Steve. And I'm honored to introduce Steve, Professor Steve Flam, to give a talk that I hope all of you will enjoy. And I think is uh, perhaps one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the areas of liver disease that many of us find the most uh, concerning when we deal with our, our liver patients. So without further ado, Steve, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we look, please, uh, please, help us uh, be better prepared to treat hepatorenal syndrome. Well, thank you so much, Rocky, for that very kind introduction. Uh, you said you've known me for 30 years. It is true that you met me when I was seven. <laughs> so uh, you've known me for a very long time. I actually wish it were true. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the CME program entitled New Advances in HRS AKI a clinical update and expert recommendations. It was very kind for the board of directors of the ALF, Rock, Rocky App, and the American Liver Foundation in general to invite me to give this talk to you. This is a very important topic. GI practitioners, liver practitioners around the country frequently care for patients with cirrhosis, and who evolve into decompensated cirrhosis. And one of the feared complications that these patients develop is acute renal insufficiency. 
because many of us, of course, trained in GI or hepatology, we're not as comfortable at dealing with these critically ill patients that renal failure is uh, the common issue that needs to be dealt with. So tonight, I'm going to speak to you about HRSAKI, and we're going to talk about the background, how you diagnose it, including the differential diagnosis, and some new treatment options that you have for your patients that are afflicted with this terrible complication. So again, my name is Dr. Stephen Flam, and I'm Professor of Medicine, the Director of Clinical Research in the Hepatology Section, and uh, am the Director of the Liver Transplantation Outreach Program at Rush University here in Chicago. Our learning objectives for the presentation are as follows. One, we're going to define the classification, prevalence, manifestations, and pathophysiology of hepatorenal syndrome. Two, we're going to discuss the new International Club of Ascites criteria for the diagnosis and management of acute kidney injury in cirrhosis and apply these criteria in clinical practice. Three, we're going to discuss appropriate albumin management in patients with cirrhosis. Four, we're going to review updated HRS guidelines and recommendations, including treatment goals in HRS. For example, long-term treatment improvement of liver function versus short-term improvement of kidney function. And finally, discuss the unmet needs of the treatment of HRS in the United States. First of all, background. Cirrhosis itself is very, very common. This is not something that I need to relate to this audience. This is a publication from about 10 years ago that suggested that about 650,000 people have cirrhosis in the United States. This number though, vast, vast, vastly underestimates the number of people with cirrhosis. You know, fatty liver alone is thought to affect 25 to 30% of the US population. And even though only a small percentage actually have cirrhosis, there are probably anywhere from one to three million people that have cirrhosis or will soon develop cirrhosis just in the setting of fatty liver alone. And when you include other causes of chronic liver disease, cirrhosis is a mounting problem in the United States, not only in the United States, but the global prevalence of cirrhosis is thought to range between somewhere of 4.5 to 9%. Now, of course, cirrhosis can result from many different etiologies. Everybody knows alcohol-related liver disease. This is another cause, by the way, of chronic liver disease and cirrhosis that has increased markedly since COVID. Hepatitis C, hepatitis B, hepatitis B with concomitant delta infection, fatty liver and that, MASH, which I already alluded to, autoimmune hepatitis, and other rarer causes of advanced liver disease, all can result in, diagno in a diagnosis of cirrhosis. And cirrhosis is increasing mainly because of fatty liver and because of alcohol-related liver disease. Pay all patients with cirrhosis are not yet sick. If patients have preserved synthetic function and have not developed any complications of end-stage liver disease, we call that compensated cirrhosis. And I'm going to show you a slide in a few minutes that show you that shows you patients with compensated cirrhosis frequently do well for very long periods of time. It is when they develop any complications of cirrhosis that short-term mortality rises markedly. And there are a lot of complications of cirrhosis. The main ones that we discuss frequently include variceal hemorrhage, which can be either from the esophagus or stomach, or other places rarely, hepatic encephalopathy, or the umbrella of ascites. 
And under the umbrella of ascites is hepatic hydrothorax, which many people, when, when you have hepatic hydrothorax, most but not all patients also have ascites. And then with within the context of ascites itself, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, infection in the ascites, or hepatorenal syndrome, which is going to be the topic of our conversation this evening. Again, there are other complications as well, but those are the main three. And again, any one of them indicates that the patient now has decompensated disease, and it should be of great concern to you as a practitioner caring for these patients that their short-term mortality is increased. These are patients too, by the way, that should be, if they are otherwise a candidate, referred for liver transplantation evaluation because of the shortened short-term survival. Now, this is what I alluded to earlier. Uh, this is a slide that shows you survival on the y-axis and months on the x-axis. So how long do patients survive? The top line, compensated cirrhosis. This was a study published almost 20 years ago. But there are, and there are other studies too. They're based, they're in basic agreement. Patients with compensated cirrhosis, they have cirrhosis. They very likely have thrombocytopenia, which results from portal hypertension, consequent splenomegaly, and then splenic sequestration of platelets. And yet they've not developed complications. They don't have, uh, they don't yet have um, any other issues that would make you concerned, like poor hepatic synthetic function. Over very long periods of time, they do fairly well. And you can see that here on this slide. Uh, this slide demonstrates that in 10 years, probably at least two thirds are still alive. Yet, when decompensated cirrhosis is present, any one of those complications we just mentioned, the survival is markedly decreased such that within one to two years, 50% of patients are dead. Now, we know when you have multi-organ failure that the prognosis is worse than if you have one organ alone failing. So it's not a surprise that serum creatinine, when it deteriorates, and thus you now have two different problems in a patient, cirrhosis and renal insufficiency, that mortality is affected in an adverse way. In fact, not only do we know that renal failure in the setting of liver failure is bad, but we also know that one of the three predictors of short-term mortality in cirrhotic patients in the MELD score is the creatinine. And again, when the creatinine worsens in a patient with cirrhosis, mortality short-term is increased. One thing that this slide tells us though is even mild increases of creatinine are a predictor of mortality. And this was a study that looked at survival after hospital admission in cirrhotics. And it showed that normal creatinine versus mild elevations versus more severe elevations, but not much of a difference, all show worsened survival. The worse your creatinine is, even 1.21 to 1.5 indicates a worse prognosis. So we, as the providers of care for these patients who have cirrhosis, have to be very cognizant of their renal function, even with minor changes. One other thing, a creatinine in a cirrhotic patient is not the same as a creatinine in a non-cirrhotic patient. And we need to keep this in mind. Creatinine is in muscle. Many patients with cirrhosis, particularly decompensated cirrhosis, have muscle wasting. They have sarcopenia. They don't have as much creatinine in the first place. So a creatinine in a sarcopenic cirrhotic patient, again, doesn't reflect the same renal function that one does in us. And this slide shows it. When you look at creatinine measurements and then measured GFR, glomerular filtration rate, 
a creatinine in a normal subject is shown in the orange line, and you can see the GFR on the y-axis, but the same creatinine in a cirrhotic patient with ascites, many of whom have muscle wasting, reflects a much lower GFR. So do not be lulled into a false sense of security. For instance, with a creatinine of 1.0 or 1.1 in a decompensated cirrhotic patient with ascites, in thinking that that reflects a GFR that's actually fine, because it usually reflects a much lower uh, effective renal function. Now, when you see a patient with cirrhosis that has renal insufficiency, and we're going to talk about the definition in a minute, this is the old differential diagnosis that many of us learned in medical school for the physician's uh, listening to this talk. We distinguish between three major types of renal insufficiency, pre-renal, intrinsic renal disease, and post-renal or obstructive disease. Now, pre-renal is very, very common in cirrhotic patients. And pre-renal either results from uh, low effective a vascular volume, a hypovolemic state, or hepatorenal syndrome. Now, intrinsic renal disease means that the kidney itself is affected by a pathologic problem. Now, that can be acute tubular necrosis. That can less commonly, less commonly be glomerulonephritis, and even less commonly be an allergic problem with the kidney and interstitial nephritis. And then finally, obstruction means that after the kidneys, the outflow of the renal, the renal outflow, the urine outflow is obstructed, for instance, by an enlarged prostate or a malignancy. So those are the three major things we always consider in any patient, actually, who has acute renal insufficiency. And it's the same differential in a cirrhotic with the exception that cirrhotic patients are the only ones that get hepatorenal syndrome. So these are the things that should be going through your mind when your patient with cirrhosis has acute renal insufficiency. Now, hepatorenal syndrome of all of those is very deadly in the cirrhotic patient. And we are going to talk about how you diagnose that. Because again, many practitioners who aren't as comfortable dealing with renal issues in a cirrhotic patient need to understand how to diagnose this and intervene quickly. The old definitions and criteria for HRS are listed on this slide. We no longer call HRS, HRS type one or HRS type two as we used to. HRS type one, the old HRS is now called HRS acute kidney ins insufficiency, uh, A-K-I. The criteria for acute kidney injury, and this is any kidney injury, even not HRS, is that you have an absolute increase in serum creatinine of at least 0 0.3 within 48 hours. So if you have a creatinine measurement within two days and it goes up even by 0.3, which in the old days, we wouldn't necessarily have been con as concerned about. It actually represents acute kidney injury. Uh, urine output of less than or equal to 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight over at least six hours. Or if you don't have a creatinine measurement within two days, that you use one that was ascertained within three months, and the creatinine has to have gone up at least 50% since then. So for instance, if somebody's creatinine was 1.0 two months ago, and you measure it today and it's 1.6, that's greater than 50%, and it's within three months. So that would be called acute kidney injury. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on HRS type 2, but just for completeness, it's now called HRS non-acute kidney injury because the, the process is thought to have been going on for a longer period of time 
than uh, and not be as severe as the acute kidney injury that we just discussed. Now, HRS in particular, not just acute kidney injury and a cirrhotic, here is what you really need to have to make that diagnosis. Patients with HRS and cirrhosis have ascites. If you have a cirrhotic patient that does not have ascites but has acute kidney injury, it is not from HRS. They have to have ascites. And it's usually a lot of ascites. You diagnose acute kidney, inj it, acute kidney injury, as I just mentioned, according to what I just uh, read to you, the International Club of Ascites Acute Kidney Injury Criteria. It's very important to note that before you give somebody a diagnosis of HRS acute kidney injury, that you give them two consecutive days of diuretic withdrawal and plasma volume expansion with albumin. And the dose of albumin is one gram per kilogram of body weight per day. So if you have a patient that weighs about 160 pounds, their normal weight, that's approximately 75 kilograms. You would give approximately 75 grams of albumin for that patient. Two consecutive days. You don't want to have shock, hypotension, because hypotension causes acute tubular necrosis. So you don't want there to be other causes of renal insufficiency present. You don't want the patient to be on either currently or very recently nephrotoxic drugs, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, aminoglycosides, or having just received a contrast CT scan, because these also can cause renal insufficiency other than from HRS. And finally, there should be no signs of structural kidney injury. And the way you can see structural kidney, kidney injury is looking at the urine. And, do you, and, and doing a urine analysis. Do you see, for instance, um, proteinuria? Do you see, for instance, hematuria? Or are there abnormalities on renal ultrasonography? So if you see these things, these, means these things mean there's intrinsic kidney injury and it is not HRS. Now, remember, I showed you this on a previous slide. HRS is under the umbrella category of the pre-renal causes of acute renal insufficiency. And when you initially assess your patient with renal insufficiency, and you've determined that there's an acute kidney process, the first thing you do when you're trying to decide which of those three large categories of renal insufficiency this falls under is you think of assessing urine sodium or fractional excretion of sodium. At Rush, in a patient with acute kidney injury, we immediately send a urine sodium on all of these patients. Remember, the pre-renal state means that the patient looks like they have, a, uh, they have, they don't look like they do. They have very low uh, arterial volume and perfusion of the kidneys. And the result is that their urine sodium is very low since sodium is resorbed by the kidney in this state. Now, if somebody has hypovolemia, for instance, they were over-diuresed because of fluid overload, or they've had very bad nausea and vomiting, or they've had very bad diarrhea, maybe even from lactulose, these are all causes of a hypovolemic state, the pre-renal acute kidney injury, and you will have a very low urine sodium. That is not HRS. HRS similarly has exactly the same type of a presentation. They also have very low urine sodium or fractional excretion of sodium. And you might wonder then, how do you know if it's HRS versus a hypovolemic state? That's where this hydration with albumin for two days comes in. And withdrawal of diuretics, you want to withdraw diuretics if the patients are on them and you want to give them albumin because you're now tanking the patient up. You're giving them volume back. If it's simply a hypovolemic state, 
the renal function will improve in those first two days and urine output will too. If renal function does not improve under this condition, now you've made the diagnosis of hepatorenal syndrome. Now, this is a slide that shows the pathogenesis of HRS, and I don't really want to go into great detail other than to highlight a couple of things. If you wonder why on earth does HRS even happen? Hypovolemia causing renal insufficiency makes sense. The patient is very dehydrated, their kidneys are not perfused well, and they develop renal insufficiency from that, and it corrects with hydration. But HRS, the patients are not flu, are not uh, dehydrated from a general standpoint. In fact, I mentioned to you, they have ascites by definition. So they are fluid overloaded and yet dehydrated. So why does it happen? Why do the kidneys think that the body has a low volume? Why do the kidneys think that the patient is dehydrated when overall the patient is not dehydrated? It's because one of the initial problems is that blood flow in patients with HRS in the body gets diverted into the splanchnic vasculature. The arterial vascular uh, system in the splanchnic system basically is in a sense stealing blood. And because of that, the blood elsewhere, the rest of the arterial volume is low. So the blood volume perfusing the kidneys is low, even though the patient isn't necessarily dehydrated or hypovolemic. So that's what happens. HRS, of course, is a multi-system problem. It involves a sick liver. It involves the kidneys. The heart can be involved too, because the heart may may, not necessarily, but the heart may have low cardiac output. And, uh, you know, and then the gut's involved too, because first of all, the splanchnic vasculature is basically getting this extra blood volume. And secondly, the big theory is there's a large role for the, the microbiota, bacteria in the gut play a major role in the development of HRS and bacterial translocation and possible endotoxin in the portal vasculature may be contributory. Now, if you said, well, you know, you have a cirrhotic patient, they have ascites, they're decompensated. This acute kidney injury comes on all of a sudden. Why does it come on all of a sudden? What changed? What changed? What what was the precipitant of the blood to flow to the splanchnic vasculature to increase? Well, we don't understand the whole pathophysiology yet, but the most common precipitant of HRS is infection, infection. And you can see that on the left side of this slide. There are other causes too, excess diuretics, GI bleeding, large volume therapeutic paracentesis, particularly without albumin replacement, fulminant liver failure. Sometimes the cause isn't clear. But if you look at all of those causes on the left and then look at the one in the middle on that slide, infection, infection far and away dominates. And if you have a patient that you think might have HRS, you should be looking very hard for infections in them. And on the right of this slide, these are the infections that occur. The most common ones are urinary tract infections, generalized bacteremia without necessarily a source of infection, or the one you cannot miss, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. If you have an ascites patient that has acute renal insufficiency and you think it's HRS, you should be doing very quickly a diagnostic paracentesis to rule out spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. SPP alone has a, approximately a 35% mortality during that admission. And when there's renal insufficiency, the mortality is even higher. So it's incumbent upon you in such a patient to make an appropriate diagnosis of SPP and start treating it as soon as possible 
in your patient. Now, what are the outcomes of a renal syndrome? We kind of know this, but just to review, mortality is dramatically increased. Some patients require dialysis. Healthcare utilization is increased. Quality of life obviously is decreased. If people get a liver transplant, we've always thought that renal function from HRS recovers, and it usually does, but not always. And there is in some patients a decrease in post liver transplantation renal function. And it also has impact on liver transplant prioritization. Because if you're if you have renal failure and your creatinine rises, your MELD score goes up and you are then at increased priority for obtaining a liver graft uh, in this UNO system that we currently operate under if you're listed for liver transplantation. Now, this slide just reviews survival in patients with ascites and hepatorenal syndrome compared to people with ascites and no hepatorenal syndrome. Now, I already told you, if you have ascites, that defines decompensated liver disease, and your survival is much shorter than if you didn't have ascites. And this slide reflects that. When you look on the x-axis, that's days. So the survival of people with ascites, once you get to one or two years, is in the 50 to 60% range. Now, when you have HRS, either the more chronic and less severe type HRS, the old HRS type two, or the old HRS type one, which we now call HRS AKI, look at the dramatic decline in survival. Again, this is intuitive. When people have two organs out, renal failure and liver failure, they do worse. But we know they particularly do worse in the setting of decompensated liver disease when they have renal failure. So we really need to diagnose this properly and treat it properly and treat it as quickly as possible. Now, when you have acute kidney injury, whether it's HRS or not, there actually are three stages. And these are relatively new. This, uh, this is a publication. This was a guidance document publication, but this came from a publication that was within the last five to 10 years. And the idea here is we need to be vigilant about acute kidney injury, even with lesser changes of creatinine. And I touched on this earlier. An increase of creatinine of 0.3 or more up to doubling of baseline. That's called stage one. Stage two is when the creatinine has either, has doubled at least up to tripled from baseline. And stage three, the worst, means your creatinine is greater than three times the baseline or the creatinine is greater than four, but there was an acute increase of at least 0.3 or the patient obviously requires renal replacement therapy. That's the worst. So these are the stages of acute kidney injury in general and HRS acute kidney injury in particular. Now, in that Biggins paper from 2021, the hepatology uh, guidance document for HRS, uh, AKI, and for other, uh, there are other topics also in this article, this excellent article, but in the acute kidney injury part, if you have stage one, the minor early re acute kidney injury. The idea is just to operate on risk factor management, risk factor management. And we talked about the risk factors that, that cause HRS. And mainly, we'll see what the risk factors are. Make sure the patient's not on nephrotoxic medications, uh, either hold or greatly decrease the dose of diuretics. If patients are having nausea and vomiting, treat it. If patients are on too much lactulose and having diarrhea, treat it, uh, those types of things. And you follow the renal function. And if the renal function isn't getting better or it's getting worse, then uh, you start to move into stage two and stage three recommendations, which are to follow. Now, I mentioned to your risk factor management, which you do with any stage of acute kidney injury, but stage one, that's the major management. You want to withdraw as, withdraw, as I said, nephrotoxic medications. You want to either reduce or withdraw 
diuretics. You want to certainly look very hard for infections and treat them. And if patients are volume depleted, replace their volume and use 25% albumin to do it. Now, stage two or three, that means, again, creatinine has at least doubled from baseline. This is more serious. Again, risk factor management. But here's where you give the albumin. And you give albumin, I want to reiterate this, one gram per kilogram of their normal body weight for two consecutive days. And you follow their creatinine and their urine output. And if they get better, it was a pre-renal state. Again, this is in people that are under the pre-renal rubric. If they have intrinsic renal disease or obstructive renal disease as the cause of acute kidney injury, the causes of those are dealt with. This is under the pre-renal uh, umbrella. And if patients are not getting better after two days of hydration with albumin, that now indicates a diagnosis of HRS. And you really want to make sure nephrology is on board and you want to determine if they are eligible for a therapy with vasoconstrictors, vasoconstrictors. And again, if you said, why vasoconstrictors? Remember, there's a vasodilatation of the splanchnic arterial bed in the first place, which causes the arterial blood flow largely to be diverted to the gut. You would like, if you could, to have a product that causes vasoconstriction, particularly of the splanchnic arterial vasculature, because that would help redistribute the arterial blood volume and the kidneys would bear the benefit. So how do you prevent HRS in a cirrhotic patient in the first place? We've touched on some of these topics before, but it, it's important to bear in mind, don't use non anti-inflammatory medications in decompensated disease. Do not use ACE inhibitors. Be very careful with diuretic therapy, particularly if you're increasing the dose. Follow those patients' serum isocreatinine very carefully. Be very careful patients are not taking too much lactulose. Uh, beta blockers are controversial in decompensated disease, or at least when, what dose and when you should be worried about them. And try hard to maintain mean arterial pressure. I didn't mention this yet, but people with HRS almost always have two other things. They have very low systolic blood pressure. Their systolic blood pressure is in the 90s maybe 100 or just over 100. They do not have a systolic blood pressure of 132. And also, the majority of people with HRS have hyponatremia. So a typical HRS patient comes in to see you or comes to the hospital and you're consulted. They are a decompensated cirrhotic with ascites. They have low systolic blood pressure. They have low serum sodium. They have acute rise in their uh, creatinine. And when you look at their urine sodium or their fractional excretion of sodium, it's very, very low. And then when you hydrate them for two days, their creatinine and urine output do not improve. That is a patient that has HRS. Now, how do you treat it? There are a lot of proposed treatments of HRS. All of them, or most of them on this slide, include tanking up the system. Remember, the kidneys are seeing not enough arterial perfusion. So you tank up the system with albumin. And in addition, in HRS specifically, you now want to use a vasoconstrictor. And there are a lot of vasoconstrictors out there that have been looked at, octreotide and midodrine together, norepinephrine, and the newest one, terlipressin. Now, I will say one thing. I alluded to this earlier. If somebody asked you, what's the ultimate therapy for HRS, AKI? The ultimate therapy, liver transplant, liver transplant. These medications are helpful. Sometimes they reverse HRS. But remember, these patients have decompensated cirrhosis. This is a very bad complication, HRS, AKI. If you do a transplant on them, not only is the cirrhotic liver replaced, but the kidneys come back. I mentioned this earlier, there's a slightly increased risk of 
lower re renal function after liver transplantation in the setting of HRS AKI. But still, in the vast majority of patients, kidney function returns. So the ultimate therapy is liver transplantation if the patient's a transplant candidate. But until then, vasoconstrictors and albumin. And that's reflected on this slide. Now let's talk about midogenin octreotide for a few minutes. This is what most of us have used for years. Midogen is an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonist. It is a vasoconstrictor, and it's thought to improve blood pressure and renal perfusion pressure. Octreotide is the kind of drug that we actually want, although it doesn't work so well. It is a splanchnic vasoconstrictor and it antagonizes the action of splanchnic vasodilators, which are increased, we think, in people with HRS. Alone, it's not effective. There's some benefit when you combine it with midodrin. Now, we're going to talk most of the time about the new advance in the treatment of HRS, because when you diagnose it, if you said to yourself or someone asked you, what is the what are the approved therapies actually for HRS? There's actually only one, and it's not midodrin and octreotide. It's terlipressin. terlipressin has been approved in many ex-US countries for decades actually for HRS. It is a prodrug and it works by acting on the vasopressin one receptors as well as the vasopressin two receptors. And the main effect is through vasopressin one receptors. And this causes splanchnic vasoconstriction. This drug works and it works well to do that. And therefore it reduces portal blood flow and portal pressure and allows a better redistribution of the arterial flow, increasing effective blood volume, and thus allowing, we think, better perfusion of the kidneys, terlipressin. Now, terlipressin was approved, and I'm going to show you the study in a minute. There are some limitations that I want to touch on. It is indicated to improve kidney function in adults with HRS AKI who have rapid reduction in kidney function. Patients, though, with a serum creatinine of more than five are unlikely to experience benefit. And keep in mind liver transplantation. Again, transplantation priority is heightened by an increased MELD score. And when your creatinine is worse, you have an increased MELD score and you have increased priority for liver transplantation, which is the ultimate therapy for HRS. Uh, so you have to be careful when you use it in patients with, uh, that are liver transplant ca candidates. And it's actually mentioned in the label that for patients with high prioritization for liver transplant, a MELD of at least 35, the benefits may not outweigh the risks. Now there's a little bit of toxicity, which we're going to touch on in a few minutes. There is an increased rate of respiratory distress and ischemia from the vasoconstriction action of terlipressin. So if patients are experiencing worsening hypoxia or respiratory symptoms, or if they have ongoing coronary, peripheral, or mesenteric ischemia, these are considered contraindications. So uh, in general, this is when what you have to be thinking about when you contemplate the use of the only approved drug for HRS AKI in the United States, terlipressin. And by the way, the uh, label actually states that you should not even initiate it in patients that have hypoxia as defined by an oxygen saturation of less than 90% until oxygen levels improve. And they recommend continuous pulse ox during treatment uh, to monitor oxygen saturation and discontinue if the oxygen saturation decreases below 90%. Now, here's the, all of the drugs that I talked about in a, a minute ago 
that you have at your option, two of which are not approved and one is for treatment of HRSA-KI. When you look at terlipressin, it is the vasoconstrictor of choice now for treatment of HRSA-KI. It was approved in September, 2022. And, uh, and that's the drug that we use if it's available in your institution. Norepinephrine has been used for a long time. It's administered by a continuous IV infusion starting at 0.5 milligrams per hour. And the idea is to increase the mean arterial pressure, the MAP, of at least 10 millimeters of mercury or watching the urine output and seeing an increase of more than 200 mLs in four hours. And you can increase the dose further of norepinephrine if you don't achieve those goals. Terlipressin, by the way, can be used on the floor, norepinephrine only in the ICU. Now, midodrine and octreotide are the drugs we've been using. You see the dose, midodrine, 5 to 15 milligrams every eight hours, octreotide, 100 to 200 micrograms every, 800, every eight hours, or you can use 50 micrograms per hour as an IV infusion. These drugs, too, can be used not in the ICU. How do they work? I mean, doctors always care most about how drugs work. They always say efficacy is the number one uh, reason why they would consider using a drug or one drug versus another. There have been many trials looking at midodrine and octreotide, not a lot looking at terlipressin versus midodrine and octreotide, but this study, this study I believe is demonstrative of the efficacy of the products. This was a randomized, controlled, unblinded study. And it wasn't a large study, but there were approximately 50 people, 27 of whom received terlipressin and 22 received midodrine and octreotide like we use most of the time in the US or we have used. Both groups received albumin. Remember, when you use these vasoconstrictors, it's not just the first two days as a lead up we're using albumin. You use albumin with the vasoconstrictor uh, as the treatment of HRS is ongoing. And when they did that, you see in this slide, a complete or partial response with terlipressin was 70%, 55% a complete response. When you look at midodrine and octreotide, the complete or partial response was only 28% and complete response was less than 5%. And these numbers reflect, I think, how well midodrine and octreotide work in HRS, AKI, not very well. Now, why did terlipressin plus albumin get approved? This was based on a study called the CONFIRM study where terlipressin and albumin was examined versus uh, placebo and albumin for HRS, AKI. And this was a 300 patient study, which is a huge study in HRS, AKI. The randomization was two to one, terlipressin versus placebo, everybody getting albumin, one milligram IV every six hours in the terlipressin group. That's how it was dosed. Treatment was up to two weeks until one of the following occurred. Either the patient had a verified reversal of HRS with the creatinine lowering to less than or equal to 1.5, or Patients required renal replacement therapy, meaning it wasn't working, or a patient had liver transplantation, or the creatinine was not getting better or actually getting worse by day four. The primary endpoint, what was the metric that was what was sought uh, in the study was that you would have at least two consecutive normal creatinine values, normal being defined as less than or equal to 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. It had to be confirmed. And then the patient had to be alive and not have had a relapse and require renal replacement therapy for at least 10 days after that. That was the primary endpoint. And how did it do? So this complete response was achieved in approximately 30% of the people that got terlipressin and albumin. And interestingly, about 15% of the placebo and albumin. So some of these patients probably really just had hypovolemia because they reversed just with albumin replacement. But there was a doubling of the complete response rate with terlipressin, and this was 
highly statistically significant. Now, I touched on a little bit of the fact that there are some adverse events that you have to be wary of. And the main ones were GI and respiratory. GI thought to relate to maybe some low-grade ischemia from the vasoconstriction in the splanchnic arterial bed. And some patients had abdominal pain, some patients had nausea, some patients had diarrhea. So if patients have pain, nausea, or diarrhea, that could be a low-grade ischemia, you should stop the terlipressin. You can restart it again. Uh, by the way, there were no serious adverse events from ischemia in this 300-patient trial, but it did occur in some patients, and you have to be wary. The other was respiratory insufficiency. They called it respiratory failure in the study, but it wasn't true failure in most patients. It was shortness of breath, dyspnea. Patients had symptoms. And it was more in the terlipressin and albumin group than it was in the placebo and albumin group. Again, because of this, FDA recommends continuous pulse ox monitoring when they're on terlipressin and either not starting or later holding the drug if the oxygen saturation declines to less than 90%. Now, this slide has a lot of, uh, a lot of boxes in it, but the one I want to alert your attention to is the fourth row down where it talks about complete response. And then I want you to go across to the right side of the slide. And this talks about what is the complete response rate by the severity of the acute kidney injury when terlipressin was used in a study of more than 200 patients? When people had mild HRS, the complete response rate was nearly 80%. When people had moderate HRS, the complete response rate was about 55%. And when people had severe HRS, the complete response rate was about 14%. So this demonstrates to us that it is very important to identify HRS acute kidney injury early, implement therapy early when it's mild or moderate so that you can actually achieve a favorable outcome for your patient. How is terlipressin dosed? Well, it's given, they in the study I just mentioned here, it was one milligram Q6. It's the same dose, but the FDA actually changed uh, the way the dose is, uh, is characterized. And the way you write it now is 0 0.85 milligrams IV every six hours, every six hours. You go for four days with albumin, by the way. You go for four days, and if the creatinine is not better or worse, you stop, you failed. If the creatinine is better, you can continue on for a total of up to 14 days. Once the creatinine gets to 1.5 or below, that's considered a complete response and you stop. So that's how you dose terlipressin. That's how you dose it. This is a new drug, only a drug approved for HRS acute kidney injury in the United States and something that you should be aware of. Now we're gonna finish in the next minute or two. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the perspective of liver transplantation in patients with HRS AKI. So you have to determine to what extent is the renal failure reversible after liver transplant? And usually it's largely reversible. When should a simultaneous liver kidney transplant be considered if you're doing transplant? in non-responders to pharmacological treatment like terlipressin. There are actually very defined rules now for liver kidney transplantation at the same time uh, when, you, when you need to do that based on uh, the severity of the renal function and how long the renal function has been compromised. And how do you ascribe correctly priority on the waiting list to responders to pharmacologic therapy? This is a struggle that many key opinion leaders have in the transplant world. When we have meetings about this, we discuss this. We would like to treat people with renal, with HRS acute kidney injury, with renal failure, with terlipressin who need it. But on the other hand, we don't want them to respond partly 
lower their MELD score and then lower their priority for liver transplantation for getting an organ because of that, which in the end might harm them. So these are topics that are under discussion in the liver transplant world. So in summary, HRS is defined as acute kidney injury that does not respond to volume resuscitation upon correction of sepsis and in the absence of other renal toxic insults. It is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality and early recognition and intervention is needed. The current classification expedites the recognition of HRS AKI and allows for potential earlier intervention. Consider the differential diagnosis of acute kidney injury in your cirrhotic. More than one cause may be evident. The management and prognosis varies depending on the etiology. HRS AKI is a diagnosis of exclusion. You exclude hypovolemia and the pre-renal uh, dehydrated state with albumin replacement, and then the diagnosis is made. And remember, not all acute kidney injury in cirrhotics is HRS. Once you know it is HRS, it requires an aggressive management strategy. Vasoactive agents such as terlipressin and norepinephrine, either one in combination with albumin, can reverse HRS AKI in a significant percentage of patients. And terlipressin is superior to other agents in reversing HRS with expected survival benefits. It is FDA approved. There are caveats. Avoid in patients with creatinine greater than five, those with advanced acute on chronic liver failure, those with significant hypoxia, and have a careful understanding of risks and benefits for those patients who actually are liver transplant candidates and who either are going to be listed or who are listed for liver transplant. Thank you very much. Wow, Steve, great talk. I mean, really, you've answered most of the questions I'm interested in, and I, I really enjoyed that. I Again, once again, I learned much from you and uh, really appreciate this. Let me ask you just a couple broad questions. Um, you know, the, the most the, most of hepatorenal syndrome, as you know, is diagnosed in the community. And community physicians really are just, they just barely got used to using a triotide and minadrin. And I think we started getting used to that. Are, are you, is it, are you fair, is it fair to say that probably they really are no, the octreotide and minadrin are no longer drugs that we should be using if, if we can use uh, telepress in that right setting. Is that is that a fair assessment? The standard of care changed? I, I think, yes, it has, Rocky. You know, when you look at the guidance documents from Europe and from the United States in the liver world, they all recommend in HRS AKI as the first choice, terlipressin. Now, there often are, um, you know, a, a, a few, a phrase or two that says, if you don't have anything else, you know, norepinephrine does have efficacy. We didn't talk about norepinephrine data. It's just difficult to administer. It's an ICU drug and it's it's a little more challenging. But norepinephrine is not a bad idea if you don't have terlipressin. But again, you have to be willing to put the patient in the ICU. Mitogen or octreotide, you can use it. You know, it has minimal efficacy, Rocky. I won't say it never works, but it doesn't work very often. I think it's one of those med medication regimens that makes the doctor feel better than the patient, actually, because we see a patient suffering and who has very poor prognosis and we want to do something for them. So we give them midodrine and octreotide, and I think it makes us feel better more than it actually makes them feel better. So again, if you really want to treat this properly, the best products to use are terlipressin and albumin or norepinephrine and albumin if you don't have terlipressin. So, so Steve, I, I, as I said, I think the majority of HRS patients are going to be in the community. And really, um, and we're very fortunate to have institutions like Rush where we can rarely transfer patients like this. But a lot of these patients are going to be, have to be treated in the community and it has to be comfortable terlipressin. What what advice do you give? So many of our people watching this have never used terlipressin. And, and really, it is now the standard of care 
I guess what is your advice? I mean, I, I assume that we have to collaborate closely with our renal colleagues, our intensivists. What what is your advice as a should I mean, and and should they how soon they should be looking to centers like Rush to uh, transfer these patients and coordinate with you? What what is your advice for us novices who don't have the experience that you do? Well, you know, listen, um, most centers hopefully have the option if they are uncomfortable managing a very sick patient with transferring them to a higher level of care center. And, and that's with any of these cases, you know, cirrhotic patients, anybody else, you know, if, if it's a case that is very challenging to manage, it's good to sometimes try to move the patient to another center. Uh, if you want to manage the patient, oh, and by the way, if they're a, in, the, in the cirrhotic patient, if they're a liver transplant evaluation patient, they have to be transferred out. The sooner, the better. Um, if they're not a liver transplant candidate or for some reason they can't be transferred out, uh, you know, terlipressin is like anything else. It's a, these patients require a multidisciplinary team approach, Rocky. You know, they acquire, they require intensivists. Uh, GI hepatologists, nephrologists, uh, you know, whatever, neurologists, if there's encephalopathy, infectious disease specialists, they require a team of people. As far as the renal part of it, again, terlipressin can be used on the floor. It can be used on the floor, which goes to show that overall it's safe and well tolerated. Uh, you do have to be, you do have to monitor respiratory function in terms of oxygen saturation. Remember, you're tanking these people up with albumin and they have renal insufficiency. So their urine output isn't as strong or as brisk as it we would like. And many of them have cardiomyopathy from, from their overall liver disease. Their heart function's not as well preserved as we like. So these people, not surprisingly, are at increased risk for respiratory issues. So watch them, monitor them, pay attention. You know, you write an order and say, if O2 sat's less than 90%, hold terlipressin. And, you know, that takes care of that. The ischemia part, having used this, I was involved in their studies. This was not really a big deal. The most we ever saw was patients having abdominal discomfort on the drug. They would complain about it. You would stop it and the abdominal discomfort went away. Uh, you know, it's with like anything else, Rocky, vigilance, vigilance. These are very sick people. Uh, and, you know, the doctors, the APPs, the nurses, they just have to pay attention to some of the details. It's not very hard. And you really can benefit some of your patients, uh, you know, who have this life-threatening complication by giving them standard of care, state-of-the-art therapy. That's great. So one last question, then um, I think we'll close out here. But so, so Steve, you have someone who uh, comes in the ICU, cirrhotic, and clearly has worsening kidney function. We're giving albumin and giving, what you say, two or three days that we start figuring out they're not responding to albumin. Is there any harm in when a, a clinical judgment says, hey, look, I think this is a palrenal after the second day. Is there a downside to starting it instead of waiting for two days, maybe starting after a day, they're not responding to terlipressin, or should we really wait that, that two days? Is there a downside? They have no ischemia, no cardiac disease. What, what, do, you, what do you think of in that, in that situation? I mean, I, you know, I guess you really want to treat the right diagnosis. You know, many people have hypovolemia-related renal insufficiency, and it has a completely different prognostic significance for that patient. If they're on diuretics, their creatinine goes up to 3.5 from normal, and you stop the diuretics and you hydrate them for two days and the creatinine comes down to 1.8. You know, those patients do better over the short term than the HRS type patient. And if you gave them terlipressin on the second day and you didn't need to, you would you would think they had HRS when they really didn't. Um, and I've been surprised, you know, I've been surprised. There have been patients that have come in and I thought they had HRS just about way, the way they presented and the severity of their renal insufficiency and they're on diuretics and I've stopped the diuretics and I've hydrated the patient and their creatinine comes down, you know? So I think we guess wrong. And, 
you know, I think it's best to give him the two days of the albumin. And then, but you got to be ready to activate. That's the thing. Problem is you give him the two days of the album and then a lot of, you know, a lot of what happens is it's another two or three days before the turn. Happened, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you got to be ready to roll whenever the diagnosis is made. Yeah. Well, Steve, I, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, Advocate uh, and Aurora Healthcare Systems, the who is providing the CME for this talk. And I also want to thank you on behalf of the American Liver Foundation. You have been a a treasure as a friend. And for many friends that you have across Chicago, you've been a treasure for us to really lean on you for our sickest patients. But you've also been just an outstanding national leader for not only uh, the ALF, but just for uh, the liver community in general. So uh, I'd like to just one more time at the end of this, just post this for all of you to look at this. This is uh, those of you who watched this uh, outstanding presentation. I really hope you claim credit for this. This was, uh, as I said, I, I I thought I knew a lot about this. And once again, watching Steve <laughs> give this lecture, I've learned again even more. So I please hope that you uh, you do this and, and, and get the CME that you deserve for this. I also once again want to just say that I want to thank the American Liver Foundation. It is a outstanding organization that is, is an advocate not only for physicians that treat liver patients, but they're also an outstanding source for you to refer your patients who suffer from liver disease. And those family members who are looking for resources and help, it is an organization I'm so proud. I know I speak for Steve as well, that we're so proud to be part of and support in, uh, in our small way. So please uh, register. I want to thank everyone again. I want to thank uh, Jackie and Ivory who have been uh, instrumental in making this talk possible. And Steve, I look forward to talking to you soon. And uh, I think maybe we should get together soon because you make us you're making us all smarter. <laughs> so nice of you. Thank you all for attending the uh, CME program. And I hope you have a nice day. All right. Well, we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone.